do want to um, take this opportunity to uh, thank Pat Martins, Steve Austin, Greg Friedman, and Jason uh, DeRarver for their presentations today. So outstanding uh, job and great information. Pat, I think I want to jump into questions. We only have about six minutes remaining in the schedule time. Before we get to the questions, I did want to do a shout out for our uh, partners in uh, Minnesota DOT. Uh, Ed Luton, Luton uh, asked me to make mention of a uh, transportation pooled fund study on bridge deck preservation portal that will be uh, linked with InfoBridge. So um, just wanted to make mention that this is out there to the state DOT partners to maybe go out and take a look at the uh, pooled fund site to um, see if this is of interest and to ask for your support. With that, let's jump into some questions. This, I think, goes into Pat's uh, presentation. Um, how many years after a new bridge deck is constructed, do you uh, recommend the first thin epoxy overlay to be installed? I think that might've been to Greg. So I, I think what Jason said, and it's a good point, um, when the initial cracking, you know, drying shrinkage cracks and stresses are removed, it's perfect time before a lot of de-icing exposure to de-icing chemicals. So after the first year is probably the best time. So I think this one was going to pan. Uh, when when you're saying uh, 25 years for the life expectancy of uh, um, overlay, is that coming from data? And I think that's for the uh, that was for, for the, the uh, dense dense concrete overlays. I, well, I think it, a lot of that is uh, it comes from a variety of just experiences in dealing with uh, these overlay systems. Uh, I know I did a lot of research back in the St. Louis area when I was there about 20, 20 25 years ago, and uh, we did snapshots of, of our overlay systems, and we were able to determine that we were able to get up to, to 25 years or so in that range. But again, like I mentioned in the presentation, a lot of that's going to depend on the condition of your deck, the preparation that you're doing in your installation practices. So you do have to combine a lot of things there to get a good quality installation. I think for Stephen, uh you know, for the cracks that you did notice um, a year out after overlays, was there anything done in those treatments to address those uh, cracks post uh, cracking? I'd say uh, regretfully, no, our specifications do call for it. Uh, in this case, uh, the contractor um, made an argument that there, that the bridge deck was, was very flexible and, um, and regretfully, again, we, we, um, did not um, seal them as, as we probably should have. All right, this is uh, relevant to the PPC overlays. Uh, do you limit the amount of delamination or chlorides in, in a deck when determining if a PPC overlay would be, you know, the appropriate overlay type? We would, we would be uh, concerned with uh, chloride uh, content, um, but we've found that in some cases, low chloride content, um, Tests that indicate low chloride content, there, there may be severe corrosion. And then um, in other cases where we've got real high chloride content, there is not. So there's there's more to it than chloride content. And it, and that's that's one tool that we would use, but it's not necessarily the deciding factor um, on, on what preservation technique to take, preservation action to take. This is kind of a comparison. What are the average design lives for PPC and um, thin overlays, thin polymer overlays? So Jason spoke to that a little bit, but how about for PPC as well? There are some states that, that have had real good history with PPC. I think Caltrans has been using it for, for uh, I want to say 20 to 25 years. Our feed, our, the feedback that we've gotten was that, that it's, it's still performing well. The next question up, um, how many years after a new bridge is constructed, do you recommend the first thin um, epoxy overlay to be installed? So is there a general thought as far as optimization when the first overlay is best installed? And maybe that also brings into, you know, some of the initial cracking that might occur during the initial cur curing or vehicle loading? Uh, on a brand new bridge deck, I, I would, uh recommended after one year. With um, PPC overlays, is there any concern with thermal expansion at different rates? This is Greg. I'd, I'd like to answer that, that question. Um, so with uh, there's about 88% aggregate in the polyester polymer concrete, which lowers the uh, coefficient of thermal expansion. So it's pretty close to the uh, standard concrete mixes. 
Um, that's the thing with, with thin overlays, they're so rich in resin that they tend to be, you know, four plus times the coefficient of thermal expansion as concrete. And they rely on that uh, kind of relaxation and stretching and, and strength of the, the deck concrete substrate. But with uh, PPC, because it's so loaded with aggregate, um, that's why the aggregate blend is so critical because the, you want the resin ratio as low as possible so that you can get that coefficient of thermal expansion closer to concrete. I have a number of questions in regard to repair of thin polymer overlays. So if you do receive some damage, uh, whether it's from snow plows or delamination, is there uh, effective ways to repair thin polymer overlays? Without in Michigan, we've started um, placing the thin polymer overlay uh, 10 feet onto our bridge approach so that the leading edge of the plow blade will start to wear the approach before it wears the bridge deck. Um, and then for our um, repairs of, uh, there's missile, there's small delam debonded areas that have spalled off. Uh, we'll just shop last and reapply. Question about um, your warranty period for uh, your thin polymer overlays. Are, are those federally fundable? Is there any issues you have with federal highways and um, an overlay? specification our thin polymer overlay uh warranty uh spec is federally funded all of our all, mo nearly all of our bridge maintenance is federally funded though is it important to engage the top mat of steel uh with a concrete overlay yeah i can answer that uh no you don't necessarily have to engage that especially uh as you know as long as you're getting that good surface prep and you don't have any micro fracturing or delams in there you want to get that good roughness aspect of, of the, uh, the substrate there for the overlay to grab to so you, you can do that without having to grab onto the mat question about the maximum thickness for latex modified concrete what's what are the recommendations for a maximum thickness well generally probably up to about uh four inches or so uh, not that you couldn't pour it thicker than that, but once you start getting into much thicker applications, it's just not very economical to do that. And you can probably use other products a lot, uh, you know, a lot better. So uh, generally, you'd probably want to get it from about one and a half to three if you could, but you could go up to four. And then once it gets beyond that, it's it's really a matter of economics. Why don't we do this both for thin polymer and also PPC? How soon after application of these overlays would you uh, place traffic on? back into operation well with the, the thin overlays it varies quite a bit because uh it has to do with the temperature most epoxy systems if you're using epoxy as the resin binder um are dependent upon the the temperature for the curing rate so sometimes you can you know cure them as fast as three or four hours and return to traffic after the second course sometimes it's eight you know six or eight or more hours um with the polyester polymer concrete it's adjustable so Typically, we shoot for uh, two hours to return to traffic time. Sometimes the state, just for their own reasons, will push that back to four hours. But because of the adjustable cure rate, it's usually in that two to four hour max uh, return to traffic time. Excellent. Anything for PPC? Yeah. So, um, for for us in in on the project that I highlighted, uh, we were we were able to uh, return traffic within four hours. I think is what what we went with. Question with regards to expansion. Um, for these various overlay systems, are there any optimal bridge conditions that, that minimize expansion issues? For example, steel girder bridges versus pre-stress girder versus concrete slab type. Are some of these overlay systems better suited for different structure types? Well, I could speak, I guess, for the concrete overlay systems. I think they would be pretty compatible as far as the expansion contraction. It may be more of an issue of the deflection issues. Uh, when you get into longer span structures, that may present an issue. Yeah, I was going to say something to what, what Pat said. It depends on the uh, how much movement you have, like longer spans. You're going to have more flex and more impact on the overlay system. And... Um, you know, and design as far as uh, movement as well. And I, I guess right. maybe just to add to that, I mean, the, the biggest thing would be trying to make sure that, that you're not too out of line with concrete, with whatever material you're putting on. Uh, that was a big reason that we were interested in in visiting the PPC bridge a year after it had been in service. After You know, we, we figured that, that was one of our initial concerns with PPC. Is there, uh, you know, is 
is the difference in coefficient of thermal expansion going to be uh, enough to to result in cracking? And, and we we were happy that there hadn't been, and um, that was one year. But uh, I, I feel uh, from what we saw, there, there wasn't really any indication of separation, and and I think that would be the same thing. You know, as long as, as there's compatibility between the deck and, and the overlay, that that would probably be the, the biggest priority that I'd be concerned with. Do you limit the amount of delamination or chloride in a deck when determining if PPC would be an appropriate overlay? And why don't we expand that to be PPC and then Palmer overlay? So any limits on chlorides or delamination when selecting those? I think chloride content is, I guess, Stephen that mentioned earlier. Um, isn't always a direct correlation to, to uh, corrosion potential or what's taking place as far as corrosion. Um, I think the term sound substrate is for either overlay system is important, and even as well as the, any cementitious overlay also, um, is that you have some tensile strength because you are gonna get some variance in the rate at which they expand and contract between the two, and you're gonna get the some variance in the way they move. So. You want a sound solid substrate, and that has to do with tensile strength and maybe the amount of uh, cracking and the amount of patching and existing corrosion and spalling because of that is the bigger factor um, more than direct chloride exposure or chloride content. Let's see, for Greg Freeman uh, indicated that, that there is a Missouri study on Palmer overlays that was completed some time ago. I think some of the states are interested in uh, that report. Where, where do you think they could find that? It's called Missouri's investigation into the long-term use of thin polymer overlays or something that effective. If anyone wants to email me, uh, Greg, G-R-E-G-G, at quick, take, K-W-I-K, B-O-N-D-T-O-L-Y-M-E-R-S dot com, I'd be happy to share the link to that study. It's probably one of the better ones out there, and I'd be happy to share it. We had a question on recommendations for replacing um, three to four inch asphalt overlays on bridge decks. Which overlay would be the best option? So let's say you're going from asphalt overlay to wanting to do some other system. Anything work better? Anything you want to stay away from? I'll just throw one comment out there. Um, there's a lot of research, you know, looking at the, the um, deck condition of asphalt uh, overlay, bridges with asphalt overlays. And it's hard to see uh, what's going on underneath. So often um, when you remove the asphalt overlay, you're hiding the deck and you're going to find assess the deck condition. Once you assess the deck condition, I think the limitations are related to the thickness. And as Pat mentioned, um, mac maximum thickness of LMC, and you're not going to go very thick with thin overlays. Um, polyester polymer concrete, you can go up to, you know, greater than four inches if you need to, but you do want that sound substrate. So um, when you remove that asphalt overlay, you need to assess the condition of the deck underneath it. Very good. The next question goes kind of along those question. When uh, considering thin polymer overlay, what's more a better indicator, condition of the deck or the age of the deck? Condition. Like I said earlier, um, and, and for us, in Michigan, if the deck bottom is in bad shape, just don't bother with a thin epoxy overlay. And then we cut off thin epoxy overlays and we switch to uh, rigid concrete overlays. Um, I don't have the number in front of me, but it might be um, as low as uh, 10 or 15 percent of uh, delamination of the surface. For example, in Michigan or uh, Texas, do you have any criteria on chloride com, uh, content before doing thin polymer overlays. I think this kind of gets to something we asked earlier, but is there any threshold where you don't do them? In Michigan, we don't look at chloride content for any of our preservation activities. And, and as far as Texas is concerned, I think for a little while we had we had uh, upped the number of tests that we had done for chloride content. And, and here more recently, um, I think we're, we're more along the lines of Michigan where we don't, we don't necessarily go looking for chloride content if there's no indication and if there's an indication of chloride content you know that, that it's really high well then you probably um, have an issue that uh, that that, um, that kind of would, would end up limiting what your options are um, so it, it's i'd say i'd say we're, we're along the same lines as michigan but because of, of 
recent um, experiences where doing testing really didn't change what direction we were going to go and, and sometimes it didn't always jive with the observations of, of the deck condition. And let me add that um, we used to look at chloride content in our deck surfaces and had that part of our decision making for preservation treatments, but we could never really find a correlation between chloride content and the performance of those preservation treatments. So we just um, stopped looking at it uh, as a cost savings measure. This is a question come from, coming from Wisconsin. Have you placed thin overlays over concrete that has been longitudinally grooved? And I believe that's where it's sawed in. Uh, grooving is deeper than tining. Does the concrete have to be milled to get rid of the grooving so, so it's flush again? Michigan, we don't use um, cut in tining. But if you're using cut in tining, I would presume that um, you're not pushing aggregate down like you do with the wet rake. So I would say that it's probably not uh, vital to remove the tining if uh, for the uh, cut in grooves. I would agree with, with Jason. If you're doing a good job shot blasting, um, you know, longitudinal tining that's cut in is it's not going to affect. The adhesion of Question for uh, Pat Martins. Uh, could you talk to uh, delamination repairs and what you're seeing um, the various states are doing in those repairs? Are there any trends or things of that nature that uh, are common? Well, I think we see, for the most part, we see a lot of states go into hydro demolition prep, which has the advantage of it'll selectively move the you know, the delaminations for you. But th I mean, there are still a few states out there that will do traditional sounding and marking. So uh, beyond the hydro demolition, probably the other option we see is just the, the traditional sounding and marking and hand patching in the field. Is there guidance for maximum span to deck length for thin overlays because of the different coefficient of thermal expansion between concrete and polymer overlay? I think that was touched on in one of the presentations. There, in that Michigan or that Missouri study I mentioned, they, they talk a little bit about performance as it relates to span. Um, I think it might have more to do with movement, but it, it probably is a correlation with coefficient of thermal expansion as well. I don't know if they uh, were able to see that, but uh, they did demonstrate, you know, in their observations that longer spans, they had um, a lessened uh, long-term performance. The Looks like the same that you, Pat, also. Um, you mentioned surface rough, roughness and cleanliness. Any thoughts on hydro milling versus mechanical milling? How, do, uh, how about sandblasting to remove any contaminates, contaminants after milling? Sandblasting could be smooth, could smooth out the surface. The preferred treatment would be a hydroblasted surface because you're going to get so much more surface profile for that overlay to grab to. You know, if with uh, your milling, you, you still are going to have to go back in and do an abrasive blast or some other type of high pressure blast uh, prior to the installation. But you're still, and you know, the idea is that you're trying to open up that service mixture. You got everything opened up for that overlay to grab to. But uh, the the hydroblasted surface prep is going to give you probably 300 to 400 percent more surface area to be able to grab to. So you would definitely prefer to do a hydroblasted prep. For Stephen, uh, in your pilot program, you chose bridges um, over the main line. Have you since applied these products on main line, heavier uh, traffic uh, bridges that um, have um, and have had the same um, performance remain good? We felt confident in in the product that we've expanded to to higher higher traffic volumes, um, and and I guess we'll we'll be monitoring those as well to, to make sure that their performance is in line as expected. So I think we'll call it right there. John, do you wanna have any closing words that you'd like to offer for today's session? Uh, sure, Bill. I think uh, probably the first thing is to uh, congratulate all the presenters on their terrific presentations. They were, uh, the content was excellent and they were well delivered. And I uh, appreciate every one of theirs participation. In addition to your own, you did a great job of moderating and particularly that difficult issue of 
pawing through those questions and coming up with some pertinent ones. And then uh, the last thing I'd like to say is uh, thank everybody who registered. And we had, uh, I think if, uh, even towards the end of the presentation, we had over 530 people uh, online present during the, uh, the the webinar. We had 660 who registered. We had, uh, I think a maximum, we got up to almost 550, which is really pretty good uh, attrition wise. So I think uh, I would congratulate everybody on a successful webinar and wish everybody a, a wonderful evening. And thank you all for joining us today. And this again illustrates, given these difficult times that Ashto, TSP2 and the preservation partnerships are still in the game and we're all in this together. And uh, I look forward to your future participation on the upcoming events. So have a great day and thank you for joining us today. Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.